Hello, my darlings, and welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Radio Wasteland. I'm your host, Chauncey Haworth, and this is my co-host, Kara Kittrick. Hello. Kara, you got some news for us this I fine evening. I sure do. So let's run down the list here. First of all, in Trump-Russia news, which uh, we have to talk about because we made a conspiracy show, and then right after that, a conspiracy started being in the news every day. <laughs> Yeah, um, go for it. Yeah, so top <laughs> reporters working for BuzzFeed released a bombshell story indicating, among other things, that Trump illegally instructed his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress about the Trump Tower Moscow project. Immediately after the story came out, the special counsel's office released a cryptic statement saying BuzzFeed's description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate. So if nothing else, it's an illustration of the tension of the information age. Is our president a crook? Is our president a puppet? Are we being lied to to make us think he is? It's a conspiracy either way. In non-Russian-related news, thank God, the Defense Intelligence Agency revealed this week it had funded research on warp drives and other forms of faster-than-light travel, invisibility technology, and other highly fringe technologies as part of the secret aero Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program we learned about in December of 2017. A list was published with 38 titles of research programs, including invisibility cloaking, biosensors and biomems, anti-gravity for aerospace application, traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy, and more. I actually have the list right in front of me. It's The list of titles is available online. Moving to India, a newborn baby was found buried alive in an occult ritual. The one-month-old was discovered when locals heard cries from a nearby pit and informed the Jalabad police, or Jalalabad, rather. Indian names, I... I'm so white. I don't know. Any new, anyway, apparently the newborn was sick, and an occultist advise, advised the father to bury the child alive to prevent the spread of sickness to other family members. The occultist, uh, the father, and several other family members were arrested. Um, the baby lived. It was fine. And uh, finally, anarchists are speaking out against the government shutdown saying that it is, quote, quite the opposite of anarchy. We are living with a state that has suspended its social functions while maintaining its oppressive institutions full-time. This quote from IPA, an organizer with the Indigenous Anarchist Feder Federation. So to wildly and irresponsibly extrapolate from these four stories, we're living in a dystopian nightmare. Either our president is compromised or our government is being run by a massively powerful conspiracy of unelected bureaucrats or both. Our government probably has in invisible spy planes and diabolical infant-killing witches lurk around every corner. Back to you, Chauncey. All right. You know, uh, before this happened, you were telling me that it was a rough week. You know, but, I, uh, you know, a rough week for, I guess it's a rough week for the paranormal, but the conspiracy, man, is definitely there this week. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. It's booming. I mean, it's there every week, but I love the Defense Intelligence Agency thing. I love that the story came out, and I freaking love this list of titles. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. are they are great. I highly advise you to check them out. Um, I advise all our listeners to check them out. Because we don't know what any of this stuff is. Right. We just have the titles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the titles are... Well, frankly, I would find it to be ridiculous... Uh, if we weren't looking into these things. Yeah, like I mean, that of, makes sense, but it's still... Something like half of our budget is going towards military spending. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're not looking towards invisibility and faster than light travel, you know, really, where's all this money going? You know? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, something. I doubt that's the biggest portion of the... I, I think research is a pretty small portion of the... Really? Of it's that just budget, stockpiling? But, it's just a massive amount of stockpiling? Well, kind of. I mean... I mean, I feel like a lot of that money is kind of economic stimulus in a form that's more palatable. Like, you know, we're going to make sure everyone has this district in this district has jobs because we're going to pay for all these tanks, but, like, we don't really need the tanks for anything. Right. Yeah. I, I think, so honestly, I, I think a lot of the military spending is basically like social programs in disguise. 
Yeah, or, That's or just funneling money to to big wigs like Halliburton. Specific districts. Like or, yeah. yeah, exactly. So a, a, I, I would imagine the, the larger portion of it is is not research, but just kind of right shady stuff. And then, of course, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, because we kind of came into this saying, like, well, we're not really interested in politics because, for one, exactly. our, our home base station that we're on is KCNR AM 1460 mm-hmm. out of Redding, California. And <clears throat> a big focus of this station is is political. Right. So when we, and we didn't want to be that. Right. When we came on here, we were thinking like, oh, well, we'll be something uh, other than politics. But but little did we know that, <laughs> that you know, right. this would, that, you know, this that, Nixon-esque situation would be going on, exactly. whether it's true or not. Um, I do have to say, BuzzFeed, really? Yeah, well, I think that's the reaction a lot of people would have. But the thing most people don't know about BuzzFeed is that, all the silly stuff they do is basically to fund their serious journalism, which is some of the best in the world. Really? Actually. Yeah, that's it's just a uh, weird combination. Yeah, so th- these guys who broke this particular story, whether it's true or not, are also the ones who informed us that the Trump Tower Moscow thing existed in the first place, I see. which was true. So yeah. exact same people. I I want to say BuzzFeed was also the Panama Papers. Mm. Um, that might be wrong. Don't quote me on that, but. No, they they've done a lot of very good journalism over the years, but and definitely then, when you hear it, it's like <laughs> five five ways our president has betrayed us. And right, six yeah, wonderful yeah. cat videos. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, another thing that so SNL, I'm I'm a hardcore SNL fan, as as Jared knows, and I'm constantly telling him about it. Indeed, um, SNL came up with a really offensive way to bring up another very good point, and that was that. Mueller, the office of Robert Mueller, responded mm-hmm. to this BuzzFeed article. Right. Which he rarely does. Which, the office is notoriously like twice about everything. He's done yes. it like twice. Right. And so Colin Yost on the SNL News made it a point of saying, that's like getting a test for sexually transmitted diseases and your doctor coming back and saying that you don't have chlamydia. <laughs> Kind of. And leaving you with the question of what about all those other diseases that you're not willing to bring up right now? And right. that's kind of the case here. It's like it's like they come out for this one and say, well, that one's not true. Well, does that mean all the other ones are true? What are what, what does that mean? You know? Right. It, it's clear. Well, I, I think it's sort of clear. It's hard to say anything's clear about this. But, like, I don't think the special counsel statement should be taken as a blanket denial of the entire story. No, I, I but, didn't take it that way either. I didn't take it that way but, either. L- well, that is how some people are taking it, but it, it does raise the question, okay, so the story's partly true. Right. Great. Which part? Yeah, you know? right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's really hard, and I, I feel a lot of people pushing back um, from, uh, I guess I'll call it the other side, because, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not a fan of Trump, as, as listeners know, but a, a lot of people do know. Are fans of Trump, maybe who listen to this station sure. and listen to conspiracy stuff, you know? Um, right. That conspiracies are what unite us all. Right. That that the crimes are really sort of hard to wrap our brains around as mm-hmm. being all that bad. Without right. without being a politician and knowing the law and stuff like that, it's hard to understand how bad these crimes are because they they say the crime to me and I'm just all like. Yeah, I kind of figured that. That's like, that's right. what big business guys do. You know, <laughs> that that doesn't seem so shocking. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty common. All um, right, I got to cut this off. We're going to break here. We're coming back with Joshua Warren and his new book, "Use the Force: A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction." Here on Radio Wasteland. Come on back. All right, welcome back to Radio Wasteland and our guest, Joshua Warren. And uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. Josh, do we have you there with us? Yes, indeed. I am happy to be here with you. Awesome. Are you a Josh or a Joshua? Uh, you know, either one is fine with me. Most people call me Joshua, but uh, I'll respond to, happily to either one. All right, Joshua it is. I will try to remember <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I've had many close friend Joshes in my life, though, so I might fall back. I was, just, I was just going to say, like, I can see the law of attraction thing working there, because you got happily twice into, like, the first two sentences. Right, so right. You must be living a pretty awesome life. So this is actually something pretty new to me. So, so uh, Joshua, let's start out and have you tell us exactly what is the law of attraction. 
Well, I think the most logical way of understanding that is to look at what engineers call sympathetic resonance. So what that means is, let's say uh, a man walks into a room that's empty except for two identical pianos. And uh, if he goes up to one piano and bangs a chord, the other piano will instantly play that same chord, even though the man never goes near it. Uh, you can also see this demonstrated pretty easily on YouTube. If you take something like a tuning fork and you strike it next to another tuning fork of the same key, the second one will ring. And this is really how basic broadcasting works. And what that shows you is that every time that you send a signal out into what you can call reality, it activates a corresponding signal, which is then sent back. And therefore, I wondered many, many years ago if this works in a similar fashion when it comes to, to human thought. Um, in fact, I've always been intrigued with a, a study called Cymatics, uh, which is based on the work of a German scientist named Ernst Schladny, who was a musician, and he would take sand or salt and sprinkle it over a thin metal plate, and then he would run a violin bow down the side, and all these beautiful patterns that look like snowflakes would appear in the sand or the salt. And so we can now reproduce that using water, uh, semi-liquid substances like uh, cornstarch and water, and it shows you that vibrations have a way of actually affecting the form of physical matter. Uh, this is something we deal with every single day from a technological point of view. And so what I realize is that there are certain specific techniques that you can use to actually consider yourself uh, a part of this sympathetic resonance so that the things that you send out will represent what you experience back because just like the vibrations are shaping the sand or the water, the the vibrations that you're sending out are affecting these physical particles in reality that can shape to this mold you desire. That's interesting. So at the beginning there, you actually use an interesting parallel that totally, um, if, <laughs> no pun intended, struck a chord with me. You know, I um, I am a failed rock star. You know, I'm grown up. I made kids, and I failed at uh, making music. And uh, one way that we would sort of, in our recording studio, come up with interesting reverb is uh, we would use piano strings or we would use a banjo, and we would play the um, we would use a contact speaker or microphone and reverse it and send it back through so that the vibrations would actually vibrate the strings that were in the key with the song and record that and use that to create the reverb. And, uh, you know, that's really interesting because I've thought about that a lot and how, how crazy that is that, you know, um, life in general is being affected by these things. Like as I speak here, um, aspects of the table in the room, you know, the room I'm in has to be deadened because of the resonance of the room and so on and so forth. But um, so when somebody does this, what are they hoping to get back? Because when I came into this, I really didn't know what the law of attraction was. What I was thinking was that it was kind of like um, we've had a witch on our show before, and, and she believed in something called wishcraft. And that was if you basically wish it and want it enough, it may actually happen. You know, but this is sounding like I'm coming into it all wrong. Well, I think it's important to point out that I have a background as a lab experimenter. I own a laboratory in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm joining you from my uh, winter residence here in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I'm building another lab. Uh, my team and I made the cover of a science journal in 2004. I worked for many years in a, uh, a NASA uh, Hall of Fame lab owned by a man named Charles Yost working on electrostatics. I've done a lot of work with uh, Tesla coils and uh, sympathetic resonance in the regard of uh, transmitting with transformers and electrostatic devices like Van de Graaff machines and Wimshurst machines. So I come at this from um, a much more results-oriented point of view. I know that a lot of books have been written about the so-called law of attraction, and I've read just about all of them, and most of them are fairly worthless. And the reason I say that is that they do basically have a tendency to say, this is just wishful thinking. You stay positive enough and you send out your positive vibes and somehow or other the universe is going to bring you 
all the riches and happiness that you want. And it's not true. People read that, and they get disappointed because they try it out, and it doesn't work where it works for a very short period of time, and they don't know why, so they just dismiss the whole thing. And what I found is, again, there is a specific technique, and I'm happy to go over that with you, um, that actually does work. Because if all you're doing is tossing some kind of a wish out there, then it's almost like tossing a Frisbee into a raging thunderstorm (laughs) and just crossing your fingers that that Frisbee is going to go where you want it to go when you have all these other forces to deal with. And so um, the technique that I found uh, comes from taking what I learned about the physics and the physical aspect of how things happen in the lab and how things happen in real-world situations, like you said, Chauncey, where any musician knows that you know this is a, re- a reality. Uh, taking that, applying it to techniques that some people have developed throughout the years, and then experimenting on my own with my own human experience. And what I can tell you first off is that if you want to be able to do this successfully and you want to be able to manifest things, you have to go through a period where you prepare your mind. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that people make. They don't make it past this first step. And you do that by taking a period of time, as much time as you can, preferably a few months, and you have to make an effort to avoid things that make you feel bad. I don't care if it's a person, if it's a family member or a friend, or my God, the news, that's the worst thing in the world is to expose yourself to the news constantly every day. Or one's uh, radio show co-host, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) Chelsea. Jeez. (laughs) These things weaken you, and you can never gain control of your own mind as long as you are stuck within this evolutionary cycle of fear. Because the reason that the news is so successful at making money is that they tap into that fight-or-flight instinct that we have. We, as creatures, have evolved to want to know what we're supposed to be afraid of so we can avoid the danger. It's in our instincts. And so there is an unrealistic exaggeration placed on fear-mongering that we are exposed to every day. And uh, so that's step number one, is to spend a period of time balancing yourself by avoiding anything best you can. I know you might not be able to do it 100%, but do whatever you can to cut yourself away from things that that make you feel bad. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because... um Like so many other people, um, up until this recent election, I wasn't really involved in the news. I mean, yeah, I I caught the world as it went by, and I was interested, but I was not glued to my screen. Uh, And and once this came out, I watch the news now daily, and and, uh, my wife and I, we we constantly comes up like, you know, what is this doing to our overall uh, feelings of contentment? Well, you see... You not only have to to sort of understand that you are out of control when you're afraid, that whenever you watch things that make you angry or upset or afraid or you're subjected to a person who uses a passive-aggressive kind of demeanor in order to try to manipulate you, we all know that misery loves company. Whenever you're in those situations, you're not out of control, and that is the opposite of what you need to be if you are going to use the force. And by the way... Um, you know, I grew up as a child of the 70s and 80s, a huge Star Wars fan, and I always had some feeling that there was a parallel between the concept of the Force in Star Wars and what I kept reading about in physics and new scientific discoveries about how consciousness affects matter and all that. And over the years, I've studied a lot of strange phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, I've been on big TV shows, movies with Warner Brothers, uh, talking about using a technology to see if there's a way to uh, manipulate that relationship between matter and energy to describe some of these weird things that people experience in life. But this is so exciting to me because it shows that this is something that can be done more organically as well. And the next step in the process 
is if you are successful at avoiding the negative. Well, Joshua, the next... um, let me cut you off there. We're about to okay. come up on our commercial break, and so uh, it seems like Next Step is a great place to come back in. Uh, you're listening to Joshua P. Warren here on Radio Wasteland. We're talking about his new book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction, and I'm learning stuff already, so come on back. All right, welcome back to Radio Wasteland, and we're talking with our guest, Joshua P. Warren, talking about his new book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. And, uh, Joshua, I'm really interested. Uh, I'm I'm excited that you're coming from this very scientific, pragmatic angle. Um, you were about to tell us about what you feel the second step is. So the first step was sort of clear out any negativity uh, from the outside that you can. Um, and what's step two? Yeah, don't don't expose yourself to things that make you feel bad. And before I move on to the next step, I know there are some people out there who are saying, oh, my gosh, this guy is so naive. What is he talking about? How can I get away from all the bad stuff happening in the world? I just want to point out quickly, a few hundred years ago in this country, we were hanging people for witchcraft and all this kind of superstitious stuff. 150 or so years ago, we had slaves here. 100 years ago, women couldn't even vote. In the 1960s, there were some African Americans that couldn't even vote. Folks, we are actually getting better. I know every single generation looks at what's happening in the world and says the world's going to heck in a handbasket, and there have been some really terrible times, World War II, World War I, but um, you have to keep this in perspective. The world is actually getting much, much better, and we have incredible medicines. We've got the ability to travel anywhere we want in the world within 24 hours. Uh, we have got air conditioning. I mean, we have got a lot of great stuff to be thankful for. So, that said... I agree. You know, before 1934, you could die from an ingrown toenail. You, well, that's you true, know, yeah. Before I mean, penicillin. It's amazing you know. <laughs> what we've got. Yeah. Um, so, the second thing is, you, ha- you to, in order to get away from negative stuff, and, and we're still at the part of preparing your brain, uh, you also have to be willing to go through a process, which I help you with in the book, to actually forgive anybody in your life that you harbor negative feelings toward. And the funny thing is you're not doing that for them. You're doing it for you because that other person and how you feel about that person exists in your mind. It's a representation of thought in your own mind, and it's actually hurting you more than it is them for you to be holding a grudge or dwelling on something that you have no control over. So you have to go through the process of forgiving people that you feel some pent-up negativity for, and then you also have to forgive yourself for anything that you feel guilty about that is in the past that you can't control anymore because you're wasting energy on this if you can't control it. So forgiveness is a part of this uh, process of getting yourself away from the bad stuff so that you can start regaining control over what you have to work with inside your mind. After that, the next step is you have to remember, going back to sympathetic resonance, that energy flows where attention goes. So what that means is we know that what we send out there is what we are hoping will activate that which comes back to us. And so if you focus and and start thinking as much as possible about the things that you're grateful for in your life, then you will attract more things for which to be grateful. And I I know you might say, well, how do I do that? Well, here's the first step, and this is in that process, and this is a very, very important thing. Uh, you know, there are a lot, a lot of great thinkers like Einstein quoted as saying something along the lines, you can live, you can make a, a big decision in your life. Um, am I living in a friendly universe or an unfriendly universe? That's a decision that you make. And so every single day when you get up, even if you don't believe it, you have to start saying, I live in a friendly, loving, supportive universe that wants me to be happy and succeed. Now, again, even if you don't believe that, try to imagine it. And what you will start to find is something truly miraculous occurs. If you start pretending 
if you want to call it that. Fake you it till you make it. If you actually live in a friendly universe that loves you and wants you to be happy and succeed, then guess what? The universe will start behaving that way toward you. We call it fake it till you make it around my house. <laughs> there you go. And, that, and you see, that's, that's important to have reminders like that so that every day you set the foundation and you start your day with this. You are setting the tone in your own mind about what your relationship is going to be with the universe because you want the universe to like you. You want the universe to do good things for you. You can't control necessarily all the other chaos that's happening around you, but you can control what you do in your own life. And so you create that, and and one of the easiest things is to just smile. Have you ever noticed how you can change a whole situation if you just walk up to a cashier and just have a big smile? Sometimes they look at you like you're an alien. Like they can't believe you're smiling at them. You know, little things like that. There are all kinds of little tips. Okay, so once you've gotten through that, and by the way, I want to point out that if, if, if anybody goes to my website, I have a, what I call a free digital good luck charm there that will help you get this in your brain as a daily reminder. I have a, an e-newsletter you can sign up for for free, and you'll instantly get what I consider this free good luck charm, which will help you with that. Um, is it okay for me to give out my website address? Absolutely, yeah. It's just my name. It's just joshuapwarren.com. There's no period after the P at joshuapwarren.com. Okay, so now do you want me to move on to the actual part of using the force? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We would I'm, like nothing better. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I do find the first part incredibly interesting because I'm personally in the per- first yeah. part. I'm, a, and I think Carrie agrees. It sounds with like me. it might be the most important and, and difficult part, to right. be honest. Because I mean. we're we both generally consider ourselves generally hateful human beings that have a negative outlook on a lot of things. So we have a lot to do. I'm on a those little first pessimistic. <laughs> but yes, well, we. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, Kara, I understand, and I listened to the beginning of the show, and I understand exactly the position that you're in. I, I, for many years, I uh, was a, a prominent guest host, sometimes for weeks at a time, on a big political drive time show in North Carolina. And for three hours, you would just fight, you know, every day. And, <laughs> it, you know, yeah, when, when you're exposed to that type of situation, um, you, you have to think that way, you know, because that's that's your job. Uh, and so I can see why you get caught up in some of what's happening when you work in the media business. But, uh, okay, so now, here is what everybody hears about this thing called affirmations. And, and I know you said you're a fan of Saturday Night Live, Chauncey, and so am I. I remember Stuart Smalley, you know, he would, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? I love that. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the silliness that most people think of when they think of an affirmation. Yeah. Um, people who do not understand how to use an affirmation, they get the impression that all I have to do is say what I want or put a reminder out there for what I want, and then the universe is supposed to give it to me. And that is, is ridiculous. You know that doesn't work. Um, the problem is, okay, let's say you've got $20 in your pocket. You've got $20 to your name. And you put a little affirmation, a little note out there on your wall or on your bathroom mirror that you're going to look at that says, I am a millionaire. I have a million dollars. Well, every single time you look at that, there's going to be a little voice on your shoulder saying, you idiot, you're not a millionaire. What are you doing? You're, is this ridiculous? Are you out of your mind? And you're actually creating the opposite effect. If you create one of these affirmations that is completely out of whack to where you are, then you are actually going to be counterproductive. Your affirmations only work if you go through a very special little process, I explain this in detail in the book, where you come up with affirmations that feel honest to you, that feel believable to you. So that is to say, maybe having $20 in your pocket is not the worst off you've ever been. Maybe one time you had $100 in your pocket. So you know in the back of your mind that that is a realistic possibility because you've had $100. Uh, so let, me, start- let me catch you off there, uh, Joshua. We're coming up on our next break. Um, 
But I am totally agreeing with you, you know, these slight tweaks as opposed to jumping right to the winning of the game. You know, you have to you have to start with what you're working with, I'm guessing, is what you're saying. All right, you're listening to Joshua Warren here on Radio Wasteland. We're talking about his book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. Come on back. All right, time flies when you're having fun. We're here for the last segment of our interview with Joshua Warren, the author of Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. Uh, Joshua, I'm sorry to have cut you off. Um, we were talking about really sort of the step to really get it started, to really influence the world around you. Yeah, and, well, you know, when you get to the point where you understand how to create personal realistic affirmations, how to use them. And I go into great detail in the book on how to do this and personalize affirmations that will actually work. Well, then the next thing, this is another great opportunity for people to mess up. And the, and the big area where most people actually screw up at, at the whole end of this process is they don't receive because they're not looking for opportunities to receive what they've asked for. So that is to say, I always ask for for this or something better. It reminds me of that story about the guy who lived in a floodplain and his neighbors came by his house and said, uh, we need to get you out of here. Apparently there's probably going to be a flood. And he says, oh, don't worry, the good Lord will save me. And so then the floodwaters come through and there are some uh, workers who drive along and they're shining flashlights and they say, uh, you know, c come on, you know, we need to get you out of here. Oh, don't worry, my good Lord will save me. The waters keep rising. The guy ends up on his roof. Helicopter flies over. No, don't worry, I'm fine. The good Lord will save me. And then uh, the guy drowns. And uh, he gets up there to the pearly gates and says, I don't understand that. I've always been a faithful servant. You know, why didn't God save me? And St. Peter goes, well, let's see. We sent you three neighbors uh, two rescue workers and a helicopter, what else did you want us to do for you? And so oftentimes you'll find that people do not actually recognize that they're getting what they ask for because it didn't come in the way they were expecting it. And so there's a whole part of the book on how to help you be aware that what you have asked for is what you are receiving. And I also find that if you're going to ask for money, for example, Oftentimes, you're better to ask for what you would do with the money instead of the money itself. So let's say your rent costs, I don't know, $1,000 a month. Instead of asking for $1,000, just ask to pay my rent. You know, ask for the physical result. And what you find, and I, since we're getting on uh, short on time here, is that when you start looking at how realistic all of this may or may not be, well, just since 1996, there have been at least four Nobel Prizes awarded to people who have proven in a laboratory that quantum phenomena actually can occur on the macroscopic level, the same level that you and I are walking around and living in. Uh, for example, in 2010 at the University of California of Santa Barbara, they were able to take a metal paddle and create a state in which it was both vibrating and standing still at the same time. That was once thought to be impossible to do at our level, only possible to be done on a quantum level. Uh, in 2014, at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, they actually produced for the first time ever multi-party entanglement, meaning they were able to take different points and have them instantaneously interact with each other without traversing the linear physical distance in between, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And this kind of thing demonstrates that you actually may be connected to the universe and what's happening around you in ways that you don't even understand that this weird stuff, an amazing, miraculous, almost magical stuff that you read about and hear about in the world of quantum physics can and does actually occur here within our own day-to-day -day lives, and I really believe that when you, when you read this book, when you go through and you get free resources, and there are plenty of them, 
If you need help, there are tools out there like wishing machines, and that's a whole other subject that we should probably talk about on another show. I think you'd find wishing machines very interesting because it ties into this. Uh, it helps a lot might. of people all over the world. Um, it, you, this, to me, demonstrates that the stuff I'm talking about here works, not only from my own personal experience and not only from the emails that I get from people around the world every day, but what the scientific community itself is telling us about all this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, this is really interesting. Unfortunately, we're at the end here, so I, I got a few uh, things that I want to throw out to you before we, we, um, you know, we lose you. Um, so these sort of ideas and concepts have become much more palatable to me over the years, and I think a lot of people, because of our limited understanding, I mean, when I say our, I don't mean humanity, I mean me, Chauncey, of what string theory is and stuff like that. Is is this something that is pulled together to, I mean, is is there any connection there? I certainly believe there is, because again and again, I'm reading these science stories, which get buried underneath all of this, you know, political stuff we read all the time. There are these science stories which are constantly reinforcing what some of the successful practitioners of this ha have been telling us for thousands of years. I mean, if you go back through all the figures in history that we consider great thinkers, great ascended masters, whatever, even if some of them may even be fictional characters, all the ones that we revere today from a philosophical perspective, a religious perspective, all of them essentially told us that there is this great human ability in order to manifest things, call it faith, call it karma, call it for every action there's, there's an opposite but equal reaction. The problem is that humans have lost the technique because we've become too distracted today by technology, by our cell phones, by our, you know, by, well, by everything. You know, I don't have to go down the list. We're, we're more distracted than ever. And so as long as we are able to readjust ourselves, then we will find that the scientists, the mystics, the philosophers, the great ministers have all been telling us the same thing, and it all fits together harmoniously and beautifully, and it works. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're close to the end here. Uh, can, let's take a little time and have you tell our audience where they can find out a little more about you and uh, where they can get their hands on your new book. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, there is a just a wealth of, I think, mind-boggling stuff that you will be able to enjoy for free if you go to joshuapwarren.com. Uh, because of my years of doing experiments, of investigating strange phenomena, you'll just find a lot of stuff there. Uh, I, the gallery of the strange has videos and photos you've probably never seen. My curiosity shop has all kinds of unusual things that I've created that you won't find anywhere else in the world. You can learn a lot more about the law of attraction using the force. And if you just want to go straight for the book, though, well, it's on Amazon. And uh, I, if you just get the, the Kindle, it's pretty cheap. And I think if you get the paperback, it doesn't cost that much either. So there's really no good excuse not to get out there and check out this book. And as a matter of fact, I'm proud to say that uh, I got an email at Christmas from a lady who said, Mr. Warren, I am the grandmother of 13 grandkids, and for Christmas I bought every single one of them a copy of Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. So uh, you can just see by the reviews at Amazon that people are saying this works for them, and I'm very proud of that. So that said, JoshuaPWarren.com and Chauncey and Kara, I want to thank you so much for having me on the program, and I, I look forward to continuing our conversations. Uh, yeah, we really enjoyed having you. We're going to have to chase you down for these wishing machines. I have no idea what it <laughs> is, uh, and I'm looking forward to finding out. You've been listening to Joshua P. Warren here on Radio Wasteland. Check him out at JoshuaPWarren.com. And his book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction. Look forward to it on Amazon. Thanks for checking us out. All right. Welcome back to Radio Wasteland. And we were talking to our guest, Joshua P. Warren, about his book, Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law singular of attraction 
Uh, I've been calling it the laws of attraction. Apparently, there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, there's only one. Inscribed on two tablets. Right. And, which uh, are magnetic, and they attract together. So this whole whole time, I kept thinking that I needed to tell uh, Jared, our our dedicated sound man, totally dedicated. He sits there, and he listens to every word, hangs on it. Yeah, Changes that's true. his life. Actually, he constantly tells us that apparently he has some sort of odd interest in otters and right. sits there and watches those. <laughs> Uh-oh. Don't you dare slander <laughs> otters. <laughs> but I, would, I, I kept thinking that I needed to uh, ask him to play a specific bumper music that I kept thinking of. And that's from uh, Little, no, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, the Don't Dream It, Be It. Yes. song you know <laughs> and i thought that would be a perfect one i should that have would be uh, perfect i should have rocked that one for our closer you know uh so i didn't know what to expect coming into this um this a lot like the way ufos has gone where mm. there are two camps the camps of 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 science and pragmatism versus the camp of spirituality um i didn't know that there was a camp of science and pragmatism when it came to this stuff uh yeah neither did i really uh Although I I would have to say, as pragmatic as this guy is, like ultimately the law of attraction is something that happens in your mind. So like spirituality is going to come into it a little bit, even if you're not pursuing it in a spiritual way. You ultimately have to. But spirituality is all about your own emotions and and your thoughts and all that kind of thing. That's but that's not that's not what he's saying. What part of what he's saying is, um, if I had a pitchfork that resonates at A, and sure. A resonates at uh, the wave is a four forty, and so mm-hmm. that's the that's the wave. And on the other end of the room, there's also a pitchfork standing up, and I I slap mine. We can hear the other one go off. I could slap mine and then mute mine, and we would hear it. No, and, I, and we I get could that. go find it. I get that. I'm just saying there's there's going to be a spiritual component of law of attraction, no matter you know, no matter what the underpinning is. That maybe maybe it's not spiritual, but there's going to at least be a psychological component. Absolutely, yeah. I, no, I guess that's I, what I get. I what I you're saying. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, uh, th- there definitely is. There is. Um, it, it's interesting that we're entering this world of possibility where faith might apply to something other than religion. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, that's, it's weird that you would have to have faith to actually interact with this thing because right now we can't mm-hmm. see it. One of the things I wanted to ask him about was, was there any connection between this and his mind to a uh, remote viewing? Right. You know, cause uh, I would, I, I would yeah, love I to get know. a remote viewer on here and, and uh, pick their brain. Cause I uh, haven't we? Well, no, we haven't gotten a remote viewer on. We've no. had people talking about remote viewing. Right, right. We've never had. Yeah, that's right. We've never had sort of a direct understanding that is of true. what remote viewing and is. And that would be very interesting to get. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say that, like, first of all, even if I don't believe in everything I said, I would have to urge our listeners to, like, try it anyway, just because it seems like good advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is good advice. You know, um, um, we were talking during the break about uh, my. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean right. to catch up. And, and the second thing is just like, regardless of what he was saying, he's clearly walking the walk because as soon as he came on, I started to feel like a little giggly. Yeah, he was Like, peppy. he was a very positive person. Very and positive, yeah. I, like, you know, you get different vibes from people. And I, I know at least one friend of mine who's an incredibly infectiously, impo- well, an incredibly positive person on the surface and I've never gotten anything to indicate logically that they are anything but an incredibly positive person. But whenever I talk to them, I get like just this overwhelming feeling that they are unmistakably sad somehow. They're dead inside. Right. Exactly. Where their heart (laughs) used to be is a uh, ice cube. Basically. And so that's the feeling I get. uh, And it's like, where is this even coming from? But this guy is like, no, I'm, Clearly, he's positive on the surface, but I'm also getting, like, some real serious positive vibes here. Right, yeah. And it's like, wow. I'm, I'm amazed by these people because I'm a general... You were smiling. I, it was, I was. It was I mean, creepy. It was creepy. That one, <laughs> the one was meant to be creepy. Um, you know, I'm a generally uh, negative individual. Yeah, um, no. Cynical, um, uh, cynical and sarcastic. I don't know if I'm necessarily yeah. negative. Uh, I, I like to see the positives in people. I may have a harsh sense of humor. 
but I do see positives in people and feel sure. that everybody can change. You know? Yeah. So but, I, I think we all felt it as soon as he came on. Yeah. It's like, whoa, someone turned up the dimmer switch. Well, I, I married that. <laughs> you know, you know uh, we were talking during the break. You know, my wife and I, we've been together uh, in, in April. Um, it will be April 7th. It'll be 15 years that we've been married. Mm-hmm. And she is just oddly, I don't think the word peppy is the right term. She's positive. Right. I, in, in all my years of, of being with her and knowing her, and you can tack two years on before the marriage, so it'll be 17 years that we've been together, mm-hmm. and um, I've never heard her say anything mean about anybody ever. That's impressive. Never, <laughs> you know. And, and when she is angry, she's right. You know, she she has held it in to the point where she understands what she's feeling and she just lays it out there. Here's exactly why I'm feeling this, you know. Now, granted, she does have her bachelor's degree in sociology with a minor in communications and early childhood <laughs> development. So, I mean, she is trained in this stuff. But That is fair. But, uh, but yeah, she's just oddly positive. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah. a little, it's a little creepy. It's a little, uh, it's a little, uh, a little creepy. Yeah. Well... Another interesting thing is, remember last week when we were talking about how we were going to do this, I mentioned that I was like hardcore into the law of attraction when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So even though I don't particularly think of myself as a positive person, I realized as he was talking, yeah, I do a lot of that stuff. Just because. (laughs) Like, I I Would you say that you did it at the time because you were positive or because you were desperate? No, because I was trying to make the law of attraction thing work. But like, I I still have habits. Even though I don't really believe in it anymore, I still like have habits from doing that that are probably positive habits to have. Uh, yeah, but totally. Like I, I do try and when what specifically I'm talking about is when he was talking about you know try to see the world as as like helpful towards you. Right. Don't try and see the world as antagonistic and like no, I I go out of my way to to do that and to think right. of. And to try and flip situations in my head when I'm thinking of them. Right. You know, in that way. I wonder how so people it's, it's interesting. <laughs> of religious beliefs deal with that. Because, yeah. um, I imagine it's similar in some um, ways. One, one reason why I'm able to, um, personally able, not compared to somebody else, but one reason why I'm able to, to think of it in that way is because um, I, I don't necessarily believe in a good and evil. And uh, opinions are exactly that. And right. um, man-made attitudes and uh, none of these things are really real other than what we chose to be real. Like my perception of a situation sure. is what I chose to be real of the situation. It's like, you know, uh, why is that bad? You know, uh, right. because I chose it to be. I, I guess it's the glass half empty thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, if the glass is half about. empty, maybe you just had to have a glass of orange juice. Maybe that's pretty good. You know? Maybe you're a big <laughs> fan, you know? So I don't know, you know, uh, I am trying to put these things into my life. I'm trying to do these things, um, not really to manipulate the world, to give me more stuff. Um, if I'm using the law of attraction for anything, I'm using it, not asking for my rent to be paid. Maybe I'm pulling way too far out to the 50,000 foot view, but I'm, I'm looking for uh, stability. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's all I'm asking the universe for is, is safety and stability so that, we can be happy and and that's really all i want you know i i don't have a huge desire for for um things right you know uh um, yeah, the things that. that i do want they are expensive like i want a computer i want a guitar but once i have those things i'm pretty good i don't need anything <laughs> else i don't need a car i don't need a fancy car um i'm not trying to impress anybody so so hopefully if i can focus on this stuff i'll get that stability i guess yeah. Well, um, uh, <laughs> listeners of Radio Wasteland, only happy news for the next six months. So that's stay right. tuned. <laughs> that's right. That's that's not true. I'm going to. You're keep dealing with in. the new and exciting Peppy Chance. <laughs> well, you can just plug your ears during the news segments, I guess, because I'm going to continue to bring in sad, hateful stuff. All right, all right, all right. You're listening to Radio Wasteland. That's what makes me happy. Come on back.
All right, welcome back to Radio Wasteland. So next week we have our friend William Pullen coming back to talk ah, about yes. famous UFO hoaxes. I feel like I haven't talked to him in a while. So uh, yeah, good and to I'm, have him in there. I'm pretty excited about famous UFO hoaxes. Yeah, we have not done that. And we I don't, haven't. I don't really know any. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think. There are people out there who are going to say, yeah, all of them. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Is that what you were about to say? <laughs> yeah, Jared's nodding. <laughs> uh, I stole it. <laughs> yeah, that maybe all of them are famous UFO hoaxes. <laughs> okay, you know, but- even if you believe like, like Roswell wasn't a... A UFO, the mainstream explanation is that it was an experimental thing that crashed. So that's not a hoax. Oh, uh, that's a misidentification. Yeah, alien autopsy. You remember that? No. Uh, alien autopsy was this video uh, that came out that was supposedly, oh, there's also the Moonlander one where they got the Moonlander and they opened it up and it was like this alien looking woman thing inside of it. And what? this one was supposedly real. I'm starting to think of a couple of these now. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's also this one guy. I can't remember his name, but he's associated with tons that have been proven as hoaxes that he's a part of, yet he keeps coming out with them and people keep getting latched onto him. So he's like a marketing genius of, of fakery. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess there yeah. is a lot to talk about there. Uh, not that I was thinking that there wasn't, but I... I really don't know many facts about it, so I'm really excited because Will William is is a uh, he knows his stuff. He knows his stuff. He absolutely yeah. does. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I guess. What do you think for UFO ufology? Do you think it's important to focus on the hoaxes in order to add? Do you think focusing on the hoaxes helps add credibility to? I mean, I, I think it's important certainly important to know what they are and then that kind of thing i i guess i don't know what you mean when you say focus on them like well, fo- we live in focus this- on everything there's not that much ufo stuff really well, we, you know it's it's like we were talking about with the uh, trump investigation you know mm-hmm. with with them coming out and saying that the buzzfeed article is not reliable yeah. does that stain all the other accusations you know so it right. by focusing on a ufo hoax do we feel that 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 is in any way staining these other accusations. I I think to some extent it's reasonable to think so, but like only to some extent, only to the extent that you say, well, there have been some you. So like when you hear about something new, you should think, you know, there there have been hoaxes, so I'm going to look more deeply into this. Right. What you should not think is there have been some hoaxes, therefore I shall dismiss anything of this kind out of hand. Right. So a healthy skepticism. <laughs> a healthy, I think the hoaxes should encourage us to apply a little bit more healthy skepticism than we right. otherwise would. The fact that there are so many of them. Right. But not, you know, <laughs> it, that's not carte blanche to engage in the lazy thinking of dismissing the entire subject. Right. Yeah, I find hoaxes in general to be really kind of interesting and... Yeah. Um, you know, like the ones where they have like the Bigfoot corpse in the ice chest or whatever, and it's some sort of right. animal. It's like, <laughs> and like, so I see this stuff and I'm just also basically this guy played with a dead thing in order to try to trick people. That's gross. <laughs> you know, that ain't right. Well, you know, sometimes in order to, I mean, isn't that illegal to, I, oh, I think so. I mean, I guess you're allowed to desecrate an animal corpse. All you Are want. you? I, don't, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, taxidermy. Yeah, yeah taxidermy. Yeah. I thought you had to have like a license. I don't know. Maybe you don't. Because I mean, there's artists out there that do taxidermy and like make new animals about out of multiple other yeah. animals, like jackalopes. Right. So they'll take like a squirrel and give it crab legs and stuff. And, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm not making this up. It's horrifying. <laughs> it is horrifying. You know, it is absolutely horrifying because I look at this and I'm just all like. I don't know if you watch the TV show Bates Motel, but I mean they're oh. they're little Norman Bateses. They're playing with dead things, you know. Well, I, I I know of Psycho. I've watched Psycho, but yeah. I haven't watched the TV well, show. Well, in the show, he he gets into taxidermy. Well, in in the as a job in the movie too. Oh well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, Norman Bates has his whole taxidermy thing, and right. what's her name comes in, and she's like talking to him and it's like hey check out all my dead animals right totally because nothing nothing brings the ladies in like a exactly like a corpse collection and uh i that's guess I we're say. getting off topic here but how do you taxidermy a fish that's what i want to know do they skin it and put it on a piece of wood or do they just carve a piece of wood to look like a fish you don't know i don't I, know 
I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, chemicals of some kind. That will I don't think so. I think it it's rotting. just a fake fish, but really? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Mind blown. Jeez. The world has so many mysteries in it. <laughs> All right. So uh, you're listening to Radio Wasteland. Next week, we have William Pullen talking about famous UFO hoaxes. Thanks for giving us a listen. Have a good evening.